So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, first episode of the Axiom Optics Microscopy Webinar Series. I'm uh, Vincent Renaud. I'm Sales Manager at Axiom Optics, and here is Oil Noss, CEO at uh, Impedex. Hello, uh, hello, everyone. For this uh, first session, we're going to discuss about the sensor cell optical tweezers and force measurement platform dedicated to mechanobiology. And uh, so first of all, welcome everyone. Before starting, I would like to invite you to check on the right, there is a chat window. So in case you have any questions or any comments, feel free to uh, write them down in the chat and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. Uh, and right now it would be great if you could just write uh, that you can hear us well, see us well, uh, that everything is going, uh, going good. And I will, start by presenting you the outline of this webinar. So I'm going to start with a very quick introduction of Axiom Optics uh, and Impedox. And then Oriol uh, is going to take the lead and present you the, um, uh, give you some intro about optical tweezers and force measurements. And then he's going to present you the sensor cell uh, platform and its main applications, um, and also share the systems highlight. Then at the end, we're going to have some time for a Q&A, a question and answers session. So again, if you have any question, write them down, and we will be happy to answer them at the end of the webinar. So I'll start with a quick introduction of Axiom Optics. Axiom Optics is a company uh, who, who distributes op high-end optical instrumentation. We have a microscopy division. We are three working in this division. Philippe Clemenceau, uh, uh, who is uh, co-founder, CEO, and, uh, and sales manager on the East Coast. Lauren Vincent, who is our marketing specialist and organizes webinar. And myself, Vincent Renaud, uh, sales manager and based on the West Coast. In microscopy, we offer a wide range of high hands uh, instrumentations from laser scanning confocal microscopes to uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopes. We also have uh, different systems for single molecule localization microscopy, super resolution microscopy, and of course the optical tweezers and force measurement platform that we're going to uh, present today. I'm not going to uh, go in detail uh, about all those products, but I just want to emphasize uh, to highlight one of them, the rescan confocal microscope, our laser, our laser scanning confocal system. Uh, I want to do that because on March 1st, we released the RCM2, the second generation of that system. And there is going to be, uh, to, uh, to be a webinar uh, end of the month, end of March, to uh, introduce the RCM2 to North America. So if you're interested, just uh, send me an email and I'll be happy to give you more information and to invite you to this webinar. In a couple of words, the RCM is an add-on that transforms a wide-field microscope into a high-end laser scanning confocal system with super resolution capability and uh, extra sensitivity. Uh, the second generation of the RCM still has super resolution capability, uh, basically same resolution still has the same sensitivity, up to 95% QE, but has a bigger field of view and is also slightly faster. So again, if you're interested, let me know and I'll be happy to share more information. With that said, I'm going to give the hand to Oriol. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Um, I'm gonna share my, my screen with you. So um, you should be seeing the presentation right now. That we see it. OK, perfect. Um, so uh, this is the outline of my talk. I will first introduce the company very briefly. And then I will explain the basics of optical tweezers and how force measurements are done with optical tweezers. Next, I will uh, do a, an overview of the sensor cell main features. And I will show you some application examples. Okay. And, Finally, a summary of the system highlights. So the company is based in Barcelona. It was uh, founded in 2012. And we are the only optical tweezers company specialized in cell applications. I will go into the details later. 
But for now, I just want to say that uh, we have a distinctive and patented technology to measure forces inside a complex viscoelastic media like cells and tissues. So this is one picture of, of, of our system. So uh, optical tweezers. For those who are not familiar with the technique, an optical trap is uh, basically a highly focalized laser beam and uh, the radiation pressure in the, in the focal uh, is in the focal point is in the range of the forces governing the microscopic scale. So if you use high numerical aperture lenses to focalize the laser beam, then these forces become attractive and uh, you can trap and manipulate small objects like cells or bacteria as the videos I am showing you taken with uh, the sensor cell system. Okay, so here for instance we are orientating uh, E. coli bacteria in space using uh, multiple traps and this is a lymphocyte manipulation. So the man who invented uh, the optical tutors technique is Arthur Arshkin and uh, he was indeed uh, awarded the Physics Nobel Prize in 2018 for the optical tweezers and their application to biological systems. So uh, we can not only manipulate objects, we can also measure the forces that we are exerting on them. And this is usually done in an indirect way. Okay, this is a classical example of uh, optical tweezers uh, experiment. So here we have uh, two optical traps and you can see, uh, Sorry, you can see uh, that we have two microspheres and there's a molecule in between attached to the microspheres. Okay, so initially the force is zero, but when we move one uh, optical trap away, the molecule is stretched and uh, the microspheres are shifted away from the optical trap center. Okay, and then we get a force and this force is proportional to the displacement of the microsphere with respect to the optical trap and it uh, follows a linear equation, okay? So it's basically a tensiometer model. And in order to get the force, we need to assess uh, the uh, particle position uh, by video tracking or back focal plane interferometry. And then we need uh, to calibrate uh, the, uh, the, pro the constant of proportionality between the force and the particle position that is called trap stiffness. So the first thing uh, that we must mention about this method is that uh, we need to calibrate uh, kappa, this trap stiffness, but also this kappa uh, varies uh, with the sample and the medium conditions. This means that if you uh, use uh, microspheres of uh, different uh, diameters or different refraction index, or if you change the medium conditions, the refraction index or the viscosity, you need to recalibrate uh, the, the system again in order to get the force. Also, this approach is only valid for uh, spherical objects. So uh, it has basically been limited to uh, uh, microspheres in in vitro conditions. If you try to calibrate the trap stiffness in complex media like the inside of cells, uh, it's uh, very difficult to achieve this calibration and it often uh, fails. So in practice, uh, this methodology is not applicable to, to, to cells. So this is what other commercial systems use. We uh, follow a different approach. We use a direct method to get the force. It's uh, the so-called light momentum method. It was invented by uh, Carlos Bustamante in the 90s from Berkeley. And um, I will show you schematically how it works. Here you can see a, a microsphere. Uh, here we have the optical trap. This is the incident laser beam and the transmitted laser beam. When we apply an external force to the particle, you can see now that it is displaced from the optical trap and there is a deflection of the uh, transmitted beam. Okay, so uh, the intensity of this transmitted beam is not symmetric anymore it uh, will change uh, depending on the angle, okay? So if you see, you now we have uh, uh, that the uh, incident beam is pointing upwards, but the transmitted beam is deflected, the mean direction of the transmitted beam is deflected by a certain angle theta. This is, this is intrinsically related 
to the momentum exchange between the laser beam and the particle. And this is what gives rise to the optical trapping force that will uh, counterbalance the external force and keep the particle in the trap. Our contribution has been to implement this method in an optical tweezer system, which is something that was believed impossible okay, before. So we have plenty of literature that explains uh, how uh, our direct force sensor work, and we can share it with you if you want. So this has, this has uh, several advantages uh, over the indirect method. First, uh, we do not use any tensiometer model, so we don't need to calibrate the trap stiffness to get the force. It's a direct reading of the force. And also it's independent of the sample and the medium properties. So you can change your, uh, your uh, particle size, your particle index of refraction, the medium properties, and you still get the proper value of the force. Uh, it can be applied on microspheres, but also on irregular objects. So you can measure forces applied on microcylinders or for instance, on a whole cell or a cell membrane. So uh, you can use this method to measure forces in in vitro conditions, but also in in vivo conditions, meaning that you can measure forces inside cells and tissues. So this is the schematics of how uh, the, the force sensor works. This is our core technology. We have the laser coming uh, from the uh, back part of the microscope, and it's reflected on the dichroic mirror and it enters into the objective. It's focalized on in the sample. The sample is inside a microchamber, which is a sandwich between a glass slide and a copper slip uh, with a spacer in between. And we have here our sample, in this case, some cells. And we are trapping here uh, an organelle, like a vesicle, for instance. And this is the transmitted light, OK? So this is the light that we will collect with our force sensor that is located here. So this light, this transmitted cone of light, is collected by the uh, capturing lens. It's the oil immersion lens. And it brings uh, this uh, light towards a detector that is placed at the back focal plane of this lens. So this detector will analyze the deflection of this transmitted light in order to get a reading of the light momentum changes and therefore a direct reading of the force. So this is basically how it works. And uh, the two key advantages of this technology over standard systems is that users do not need to calibrate the system to measure the force, and that forces can be measured inside cells and tissues. So let's now uh, see um, uh, a little bit about uh, the system. Uh, there are two main models. Uh, we have the optical manipulation model that uh, generates the optical traps, and then we have the force detection model. These are both accessories to optical microscopes. This is a photograph of a, of a customer uh, setup in Barcelona. And this is a close-up of the uh, force detection model. It substitutes the original condenser of the microscope. It lets the light go through. So it leaves all the uh, imaging capabilities of the microscope intact. And this is the optical manipulation model attached to the back part of the microscope. Here's the laser fiber. And here uh, we have all the optics that will generate the optical traps in the sample plane. The system is compatible with uh, fluorescence imaging uh, techniques like spinning disk confocal. Uh, there's a system here uh, from a client with a, a spinning disk from, from under. And it's also compatible with turf and epifluorescence imaging and uh, with the models from the TI2 labs uh, modular system from Nikon. OK, so this is the sorry, this is the software, how the software looks like. It's basically uh, the integration of two softwares. From one side, we have LabVIEW. Uh, this is the main uh, panel. OK, this controls all the feature of the sensor cell system. And this is the uh, project window where we have uh, different functions that you can use to build your own uh, routines, OK, to program your own routines. OK, and then we have micromanager for imaging to control uh, the camera or the microscope. 
uh, both softwares are integrated in such a way that you can operate directly in micromanager in this imaging window to control the sensor cell features. So I'm going to show you how to generate an optical trap and how to move it uh, in its most simple way. It's a manual uh, manipulation, okay? We call it the click and drag mode. So we have an optical trap here. This is the trapping area, okay, this red square. And we have two microspheres. We will uh, click on the optical trap, move it over the microsphere and it's trapped. And we will now generate a second trap by clicking on the screen. And then we move it around by dragging the mouse icon and that's it. Okay, <clears throat> it's very simple. Uh, so you generate this, the traps like this, just by clicking and moving them. But this is done manually. Usually you will uh, want to apply uh, predefined trajectories or oscillations. So you can do this with the system. And uh, there are uh, menus in the two, in, uh, there are tools in the menu. One of them is trajectories. So you can apply a trajectory on particles uh, as, as you see here. Okay, <clears throat> when you select uh, the trajectory tool, a window appears. You can enter here the space and time coordinates of your trajectory and apply it directly on your optical traps just by right clicking and selecting start trajectory. Or you can also load a TXT file where you have previously entered your coordinates. And you can do the same thing with oscillations. There's a tool that it's called oscillations and you can there select the frequency, the amplitude, uh, the waveform. Okay, so you can combine these different modes. You can, for instance, generate an oscillation <clears throat> and then apply a linear trajectory in this case and combine this with the click and drag mode. Okay, so now the uh, trajectory will come back to its original position and now we can just stop the oscillation. Okay. So um, you can do many things with the system. I don't want to go into everything. Uh, just to show you the degree of flexibility and how powerful it is in, our, in terms of manipulation, I want to show you this feature. <clears throat> we developed this for uh, a couple of clients. It's uh, pattern morphing. Uh, these clients were working with uh, colloid physics, crystal, uh, liquid crystal physics, and uh, another one was working in biofilms bacteria. And they asked us to, 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 to do this, this uh, routine. Okay, so here uh, we can enter different patterns, uh, the, the coordinates of optical trap patterns positions, and we can change from one pattern to another, okay, in this way. So uh, you can do uh, things like this, okay? It's, it's, as you can see, it's uh, very flexible, okay? And you can do it with many traps. The, the system can generate up to uh, 256 uh, simultaneous traps. Okay, this is about manipulation, but you can uh, measure forces, of course. So <clears throat> the system provides with you two plots. So you can look at the, uh, force and position signal in the X and Y coordinates for two different traps at the same time. Okay, if you have more traps, you have this selector here and you can choose the trap number that you want to plot. In this case, uh, we have uh, four traps here. We have uh, in the first three traps, uh, particles oscillating uh, of different diameter and oscillating in different directions. And you can see here that we are looking at trap number one, trap number two here. In blue, you can see the uh, triangular uh, oscillation of this particle. And the red signal gives you the force in Y. If we select trap number three, the force is zero because we are looking at the force in Y direction and trap number three is oscillating in the X direction. The same happens if we go to trap number four, we see nothing because in trap number four, there is nothing trapped. Okay, of course, you can look at the data at real time, but you can also save the data for its further analysis. Okay, um, you can also uh, build your own routines with our software development kit. 
to do this, you just need to create a new function. Okay. <clears throat> and here you generate a structure. In this case, uh, uh, we will generate a flat sequence. And then you go to the uh, light taste project window. And here you have all the functions that we provide you uh, that would allow you to control all the features of the sensor cell system. So you have functions for, to create trajectories, oscillations, force clamping, uh, to, to do force measurements uh, or read positions, okay? Whatever. So you choose the functions, you drag them into your sequence, and then you start building your routine, okay? So you can build routines like this one. In this case, <clears throat> I don't go into the details, but we use the trajectory function to create a collective trajectory routine. This is one example, one of the examples that we provide you. Okay, and this routine, you can see it's very simple. It uh, applies with just one click, a predefined trajectory to different uh, traps at the same time. So uh, this uh, routine, when you click on the play button, will apply uh, this trajectory on trap number one, trap number four, and trap number seven. Okay. Um, we give you a manual with uh, many examples in order to help you to do this, or we can also assess you. So this is one example from one of our clients. He used an optical trap to track the force dynamics of micro -swimmers. Okay. <clears throat> These are force measurements uh directly on the cell and he built uh this uh, application where he plotted the uh force in x and y in 2d and also force x and force y versus time to see the oscillatory dynamics uh according to these uh oscillations of the beating uh, flagella this is part of a work that has been recently published in physical review e Okay, let's see some application examples. Um, I will begin with a classic application of uh, cell uh, membrane tension or tether pulling experiments. So here, uh, the researchers uh, use sensor cell to trap a fluorescent bead, and they uh, move the bead towards the axon of a neuron. A membrane tether is formed, and then they move the bead back uh, to elongate this tether and apply attention on the action. Okay, so this is a confocal uh, image of, of the process. You can see the bit here, and at each pulling step, the velocity is increased. Okay, so you can see here the trap position. You can see from the slope of each pulling step that the velocity increases, so we have an increase in pulling rate. And you can see here the signal for the force. So you can see that when the uh, pulling rate is increased, the peak force, the peak of the force increases. And this is the relaxation curve for each step. So the, uh, the researchers apply uh, models to fit this relaxation curve in order to assess the mechanical properties of, of the axon, in particular, its in internal tension. The same kind of experiment was carried out with uh, HeLa cancer cells. Uh, perhaps you can see here the membrane there, okay? And I'm showing you here the data for two experiments, a high pulling rate experiment and a low pulling rate experiment in red. You can see it from the slope, it's much higher in the blue case. And if you look at the force, you can see that the force peaks for the high pulling rate experiment are much higher than for the low pulling rate experiment. But if you look at the relaxation uh, of the force, it's practically the same for the both conditions. Okay. Um, you can also use this approach to, to check the activity of mechanosensitive ion channels. In this case, uh, the authors uh, use uh, these uh, tether pulling routines that they generated. Uh, they programmed it with the system and they look at the uh, calcium signal with a spinning disk confocal uh, imaging. Okay, so you can see that the, cal the calcium signal is changing uh, at each pulling step. This is part of a work that is uh, now available as a preprint in BioArchiv. 
Uh, okay, let's talk about motor proteins activity. This is a classical experiment with optical tweezers, but uh, typically it's done in in vitro conditions. I am going to show you results in in vivo conditions inside cells. So you can see here a video of uh, uh, the optical trapping of a vesicle inside a cell. So uh, we did the same thing, uh, trapping lipid droplets in A549 cells. And we measured the stall force of kinesin motors inside the cell. Okay, so this is the typical force when the trapping force uh, reaches a plateau around seven piconetons, the kinesin motor detaches from the microtubule and it goes down to zero, okay? This is what you obtain in in vitro conditions and uh, we managed to do these uh, uh, measurements inside the living cell. But you can do more than this. You can look at different motors at the same time. Uh, for instance, cooperating. This means that they are pulling on the same cargo uh, cr uh, along uh, the same filament in the same direction. And now you can see here that the, for the parallel component of the force, you have a plateau at seven piconewtons and a second plateau at 14 piconewtons. This means that here you have one motor and here you have two motors pulling. For the perpendicular component, the force is practically zero. Here you have the histogram of the force. And uh, you can see an opposite scenario where uh, the two motors are competing because they are uh, pulling on the same cargo across diff along different filaments, okay? And now you don't see the plateaus, you see uh, for the force in X and Y, these peaks going up and down. And if you plot this in two dimensions, you can now uh, see uh, the back and forth movement of this cargo along the two filament directions. Again, this is measured inside the cell. Okay, active microbiology is another application. The system has a built-in routine uh, to do these kind of experiments. Uh, basically, what we do is we apply an active perturbation to the particle uh, that is trapped, followed by a passive step, and then another active perturbation. These are oscillatory uh, perturbations of increasing frequency. So you can see how it's uh, oscillating. And <clears throat> you can embed particles, for instance, inside uh, hydrogels in order to assess their mechanical properties. For instance, polyacrylamide gels, which are viscoelastic. The system, uh, this routine uh, computes the complex shear moduli, uh, G prima and G2 prima, which stand for the elastic and the viscous part. And you can see that you can prove uh, the, the system up to the uh, kilohertz regime, and you can prove uh, stiffnesses up to uh, several kilopascals. We repeated this kind of experiments inside cells. <clears throat> we did this. Uh, with uh, people from uh, Collège de France and Institut Curie in Paris. Uh, we did this inside uh, mouse oocytes and um, mouse early embryo cells. We did not use uh, microspheres to do this. We, uh, we trapped directly uh, vesicles inside the cell to probe uh, the cytoplasm. And these are the results that we, are that we obtained. Okay, these are... Uh, preliminary results uh, for the uh, elastic and, and viscous part of the shear modulus. If you want to look at um, published data, there's a paper from uh, Timo Betts lab in Germany. Uh, he, he, it's a very recent paper. It's, uh, uh, it's now, uh, you can check it as a preprint. And he used our uh, force sensor to, to check, to measure the, um, the uh, viscoelasticity of the cytoskeleton uh, inside uh, dividing cells. Okay, um, now I'm going to show you a, a, a very beautiful example of nuclear mechanics. Here, the authors uh, used microspheres internalized into zebrafish stem cells. Uh, these are fluors and uh, microspheres, so they uh, use sensor cell to trap uh, the microsphere and apply a trajectory to indent the cell nucleus. This is part of a work that has been uh, published last year in Science and that was led by uh, Verena Rubrecht from the Center of Genomic Regulation. So this is a confocal image of the cell. In blue, you can see the nucleus. 
here you have uh, this little dot here is the fluorescent bead and you can see that um, we trap it and we apply a trajectory to indent the nucleus this is the deformation of the nucleus okay i'm going to show you some data the authors did the same experiment in two conditions for cells in suspension and for cells confined in micro chambers of a thickness of 10 microns so you see here uh, the optical trap position this is the indentation process then the trap stays there for a while and it goes back to the original position and you can see here the force signal this is the peak force and then the relaxation of the force during the indentation and then when the particle goes back to the original position the force goes uh, back to zero these are uh, some uh, relaxation curves of the force for different tests for the two conditions okay so you have suspended cells and confined cells so the authors uh, uh, did some fittings to these relaxation curves and obtained different parameters like the uh, uh, characteristic uh, decay time and the stiffness of the cell nucleus for the two conditions. We repeated this experiment with people uh, from Paris, from Mathieu Piel's lab. In this case, <clears throat> the system was not used with a confocal imaging but with epifluorescence imaging. So the nuclei were uh, labeled with epifluorescence. We used three micrometer bits to indent the nucleus. And this is the data that we obtained. This is an example. So the trap position in red, the force signal in blue. And these are the relaxation curves that we obtained for HeLa cancer cells and human retina cells. So I will end up with uh, the last example immune uh, cell cell interactions in this case we have two optical traps um, in the left we have a cancer cell on the right we have a t-cell and we will move the t-cell towards the cancer cell then we will wait for a few seconds to see if there is some kind of interaction between these two cells and then we will move the t-cell back and we will check if there has been any addition force so it's this video here, here's the cancer cell, here's the T cell, and you will see the force signal here. So uh, we move the T cell towards the cancer cell. We wait for a few seconds and now and then we will pull the T cell back. You will see that the force will start increasing. and it will increase until it will reach uh, a value that is capable of breaking this bond okay so there is some resistance here now the bond is broken and the force goes down to zero so this height here will give you the addition force of, of the two cells in this case the measurement gave us 21 piconewtons which is more or less the force that one would expect for a single T cell receptor. So with <clears throat> people from the immunotherapy department of the Central Hospital Clinic here in Barcelona, we did some tests with different uh, target cells and different engineered T cells expressing different receptors. I cannot disclose uh, uh, the, the data, but uh, this is just to show you, uh, to exemplify the kind of statistics that you can obtain with the system. Okay, so I will just end with some uh, brief summary of the system highlights. The system comes with a single frequency laser with a very low noise, uh, especially good for frequency test. Uh, it's a five baud laser. The wavelength is 1064 nanometers. Uh, the system can generate up to 256 optical traps at the same time. It's based on acoustic optic deflection technology. Uh, you can use the click and drag mode to control the traps manually, or you can program arbitrary trajectories, oscillations, and, and patterns. You can measure forces without needing any previous calibration on up to 256 traps at the same time. You can measure forces inside cells and tissues, and you can trap and measure on non-spherical objects also, or directly on cell or cell membrane. 
The sampling frequency is 25 kilohertz. We have a built-in routine for active microbiology test. We have a built-in routine also to apply force clamping. Uh, we provide with a software development kit to that allow our customers to develop their custom routines so they can program their experiments if they are going to re they are going to repeat them uh, several times the you can record video and it's synchronized with force and position readings and the system is compatible with uh, bright field imaging but also uh, fluorescent imaging like turf, epifluorescent, or confocal imaging. Well, um, thank you very much for uh, your attention, and uh, I'm ready for your for your questions. Thank you, Oyol. Uh, it, it's really amazing to see everything you can do. Uh, I mean, how you can play with with cells, with with biological samples. It's uh, I really liked it. Uh, I hope everyone liked it as well. Um, we got a couple of questions. So if you have more questions, this is the time uh, since we're going to move to the Q&A session. So we had a first question. Arno, maybe you can join us uh, if you want to. Perfect. Um, hi, uh, so Arno is the CTO uh, of Impedax. Uh, we had a first question from Min, uh, which was what difference in index of refraction between sample and solvent is required in order to trap an object with the system, to which I know uh, you answered that the, the the only requirement is to have uh, the refractive index of the particle, which is larger than uh, than the one of the of, of their surroundings. Right? Do you want to give uh, more info about that? Um, yeah. So basically, uh, there is no uh, limit on what you can trap. I mean, you can trap in principle anything which has. Uh, uh, refractive index larger, uh, slightly larger than the uh, medium where the particle is. Uh, but in general, uh, to obtain a, a reasonably high optical force, we need uh, a contrast in the refractive index. Uh, typically, if you are in water, the, the particle should have a refractive index at least of 1.4, I mean, similar to to a cell, okay, 1.378, okay. From there, we can start trapping things, okay. We can use uh, silica particles to increase the contrast and then um, increase the force, or we can even increase more the force by using, for example, polystyrene particles and use them as handles, okay, like in the, the experiment that uh, Ariel was showing. There we, uh, uh, the, the customers were, uh, we're putting these microspheres inside the cell so as to increase the contrast uh, with the surroundings and then increase the, the optical force. With these particles, these uh, polystyrene particles, one can easily reach uh, 100 piconewtons, okay? which is a, a force that allows you to, to tackle uh, already uh, many different questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Arno. We had uh, another question from uh, Paul. Um, how, how invasive is this method for single cells? So uh, I think the question is most regarding uh, phototoxi phototoxicity and photo damage you can create, right? So the, it, you, you, you answered, I mean, maybe you want to, to comment on that, I know. Um, uh, yeah, so basically it's a, it's a very complex um, a question because it depends uh, largely on the conditions. Uh, depends. The, the most critical thing is the cell type. So, for example, there are cells which are very sensitive to light. For example, um, um, these yeast cells are very sensitive. So, already with 20 milliwatts, they they start uh, behaving differently. Okay. Uh, whereas with other cell kinds, cell types, you can reach hundreds of milliwatts without inducing any damage. Or even with embryos, there are uh, different. Uh, publications showing experiments with uh, embryos, Drosophila embryos or zebrafish embryos using hundreds of milliwatts, okay, uh, 500, 600 milliwatts, and uh, still the the the, um, the embryo was 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 looking fine, okay. So it depends a lot on the cell type. Typically, yeah. we recommend to uh, keep um, uh, the laser power at uh, a level which is not toxic, okay, but allows you to. Uh, exert um, forces, um, force, high forces, okay? So it allows you to, 
to <coughs> apply forces uh, comparable to, to the forces governing uh, cells, okay, or molecules at, at this scale. But typically, 100 to 100 millibats it's a, a good, it's a reasonable uh, value, okay. But but it's it's something you have to take into account for sure. When it's so one thing I, I can I can add is that um, um, well, uh, phototoxicity will also depend on on the time exposure of exposure, right? So mm -hmm. typically, when you set up the experiment, uh, when you manipulate your objects to set up the whole experiment, you use very low powers. And then only when you want to apply the force, you increase uh, the laser power in order to, 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 to be able to apply that force. And, and the experiments where you need to apply uh, a big force uh, typically are in the range of a few seconds. I mean, all, all the uh, applications that I have shown you are in the range of, of seconds, right? Of course, if you want to apply a high, a high force for uh, several minutes or an hour, then things get more complicated. Uh, but typically, uh, in experiments of cell cell addition or indentation or tether pulling, uh, it's only uh, some seconds. So uh, the rest, for the rest of the experiment, you you are using uh, low powers to manipulate the sample. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Oyo and Arno. There was another question from Koshik. Um, does this mean that uh, so? Basically, can we only trap uh, cells that are adherent and that are grown on slides? And to which uh, I know you answered that. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, you, so your customers usually grow cells on slides yeah. or on cover slips, uh, but it's you're not limited to that, right? Uh, they could no. grow it on uh, on chambers. Uh, they could have them in, on petri dishes, in petri dishes. Yeah. So generally, I mean, uh, the fact that we uh, typically use um, glass lights is just for convenience. Uh, the only requirement is that the lens of the sensor must be in contact with the sample. So there, there must be uh, space for the lens to get in contact with the sample. If you use Petri dishes, which are um, too small, then the lens won't fit there. And that that's not valid. But if you use uh, use uh, larger petri dishes, then it's fine. I mean, it's it's just a um, a geometry thing, okay? A problem. Uh, you can use uh, glass lights, petri dishes, or other uh, microfluidic uh, chambers. So there's there's no restriction on that. Yeah. So just to to make it clear, we are talking about the the force measurement sensor with sensor which is coming from the top, from and the top. that needs to be uh, in contact with the sample. Contact. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so so that that puts some restrictions on the geometry of the of the chamber. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. And there was also a question from from Koshik uh, regarding the the force resolution and also the uh, the accuracy of the of the position of the um, of the optical tweezer. Yeah. Uh, and you say the so the force resolution is in the order of uh, femto newton. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the resolution is femtonewtons, and uh, yeah. position resolution is in Armstrong's. I mean, uh, in terms of precision, what you can measure um, depends. I mean, resolution is the, the minimum step you can measure. Uh, in terms of what you can actually measure, taking into account sources of noise, etc., typically it's uh, in the order of uh, 0 0.1 piconewtons and uh, uh, one nanometer. That's the more or less the scale where we we are. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. Um, I, are there any other questions? I mean, looks. I mean, not for now. But if you have any other questions, please write them down now. Mm -hmm. Or you can also write us an email, and we are happy to answer you later. Great. Okay. Well. Oh. Uh, uh, with two more questions, actually. Uh, okay. What is the maximum force you can apply and measure as well? And uh, the other one? Uh, so yeah, go, start, let's start let, by answering yeah. this. Let me, let me start with this one. Uh, uh, yeah, Pau is, is uh, putting some, some complex questions. Uh, maximum <laughs> force depends, uh, as, uh, again, depends a lot on, on the experiment. Um, 
we, we could we could say typical maximum uh, force is uh, hundreds of, of piconewtons. Depends again on the laser power. And the limitation of the laser power is the damage, as uh, we were mentioning before. So for 100 to 100 milliwatts, as uh, I said before, that that's what we recommend, typically recommend. It's a standard, but uh, um, typically 100 to 100 milliwatts, that would represent 100 to 100 piconewtons, more or less. Okay. Um, for example, the experiments of the nucleus indentation that we showed were done at 200 milliwatts, and forces were uh, uh, no, but a little bit below 100 piconewtons, I think. Okay, just to, to give uh, some. So you said one, one milliwatt of laser power is uh, one uh, one piconewton. Pico yeah, about. Not, and not it's exactly. one milliwatt, yeah, more or less. And it's one milliwatt on the laser, not on the sample plane. As a rule of no, thumb? No, at, at the sample plane. At the sample plane, okay. The sample plane. As a rule okay. of thumb, the drop stiffness is one. one piconewton per milliwatt per micron. OK. Um, and, yeah. yeah uh, regarding uh, force measurements in, in 3D tissues, uh, clearly it, 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 uh, it's more challenging. Um, we have done uh, some things inside uh, zebrafish or C. elegans. Um, I can perhaps show um, one yes, slide. Let me let me comment on the, the problem while you look for the yeah. data. Uh, so the thing is that when you work with uh, tissues, then you have layers of cell uh, above and below your trapping point. So there's scattering uh, out of out of focus. Okay, so there's light scattered at different layers of cells above and below uh, your trapped particle. And that affects, um, affects the measurement of the force. Because what we do, as, as Oriol explained, uh, is um, capture the light going through the sample and analyzing the deflection of the beam. But if that deflection is somehow contaminated due to uh, deflections at other layers of cells, then the reading is incorrect. We have an artifact. Okay, so that's why it's more challenging, uh, as as he was pointing out. Um, basically, because as as the thickness of the sample increases, the uh, uh, scattering out of focus increases as well, and therefore the the uh, contamination of the reading increases. Okay. Yeah. Let Let me show um, one slide, please. Um, okay. Um, so. Uh, so this is what uh, Arnaud was talking about. This is how the uh, pattern of light looks like with uh, different samples. This is in water. Okay, this is the pattern of light that we analyze with our okay, detector. Can you do it uh, larger because. Uh, um, sorry. Presentation yeah. Presentation mode. Okay. So this is the pattern of light that we analyze in water, light medium. This is inside a mammal cell. This is a plant cell. You can see here the deflection of the light with. In the the cell walls, and this is a several fish embryo. Okay, um, so uh, when you go to three D structures, um, then uh, the reading has more noise, and and therefore uh, the error is higher. So basically, in in embryos, we have uh, uh, m larger errors. Okay, than in water, like medium. Um, yes, we we. More or less, um, uh, we've uh, characterized this. And uh, in zebrafish, is around, we have an uncertainty of around 30%, more or less. Yeah. So um, in, in we, we, is, is larger. Yeah, in Drosophila, it's larger. Uh, here, uh, I am just showing you an example uh, to show you that we can exert forces that are high enough to bend cell uh, cell contacts, even though. Uh, the force measurements here have large errors, OK? Uh, this is a confocal image of a Drosophila embryo. Um, I must say here that uh, we uh, applied an optical trap in this position. This is the, uh, the cell contact, OK? Um, uh, here, we did not use any microsphere, OK? The force was directly applied 
on the cell membrane. And you, first we put the optical tweezer in the middle of the cell contact, then we move it uh, a micron away. And you can see here the, me the membrane movement that we recorded with video tracking, okay? Um, here we start to trap on and, and the membrane starts bending and then we uh, switch off the laser then the uh, membrane position recovers to back to its original position. Okay, the force was estimated here to be around uh, 300, well, the trap stiffness was estimated to be around 300 piconewtons per micron. Okay, and we also did some experiments inside zebrafish embryos. These are the embryos. Um, we did uh, the same experiments to, to assess, uh, well, to exert a force on this axon here. This is a neuron, this is the axon. And uh, basically the experiment uh, ex introduces an optical trap next to an axle and, and the axon will bend because it will sense the force of the optical trap. And you get uh, this, uh, this is what we should expect. This is the axon trap uh, relative position, okay? So first the trap is on the axon, then we move it uh, one micron away or so, and then uh, the uh, axon trap relative position relaxes, okay? Because the axon is bending towards the optical trap because it's feeling the force of the trap. And in the force, you will see the opposite angle. You first, the force is zero because you are on the axon. When the trap is moved away, you see a peak and then a relaxation. And this is what we obtained inside uh, the, the, the embryo, okay? So it's, it's very similar to what we expected. Uh, although I must say that this is a preliminary data, okay? This is not a, a, a experiment uh, done in regularly. Um, here you, you have also the problem that uh, you are applying force not only on the axon or the cell contact, but on other structures surrounding it. So it's everything gets more complicated. Okay, but potentially, I mean, uh, the technology uh, in the future <laughs> we expect it to allow doing this this kind of experiment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for this uh, for this very detailed answer. Do we have uh, do we have more questions? Doesn't seem so, and we are already past the the forty five minutes. So I think we can uh, we can finish here. But if you have any questions in the future, uh, in any case, I will reach out to you with the recording of the webinar and with more documentation about the the, the system and the technology. So you can just get back to me if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye. Bye.